and uh, welcome to this course uh, on uh, uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy uh, the cases which still have active neovascular complexes and most of these are young patients and uh, uh, we'll be discussing the challenges and uh, you know issues when we start managing them but uh, uh, next slide please so just to give you the background why this course uh, so i think we have been doing all of us uh, all our colleagues have been doing courses on pdr surgeries for quite some time so what we realized was that uh, most of the times the conventional teaching has been that do a good nice prp and wait for you know traction to involve macula and most of the times because of other comorbidities the surgery in pdr cases is quite delayed and this is just one example of a case where you see intense uh, prp has been done and on your uh, left side this is post operative picture next can you click next and actually this left eye was operated by me but this was pre op ocity so despite that fact the fact that it looks like very well lasered pdr you can see the status of macula and uh, on your right side this is the left eye again heavily lasered eye but still there is a trd which is affecting macula next and you see this is uh, next this is the ocity of uh, of the left eye so point i wanted to make here was that uh, all of us do agree when we talk uh, backstage we are colleagues we are all saying that we should do surgery much earlier than what has been taught what we see in our practices but uh, the challenges of doing early surgery is that you will be touching eyes which which have uh, active neovascular complexes florid nvd and nves so how to tackle them and what are new additional challenges when you start uh, doing early surgeries so this is the background of this uh, instruction course and i have very good uh, uh, co instructors with me uh, dr ajay pal singh uh, he is from jaipur uh, he is a very uh, prolific vr surgeon uh dr jatender singh uh, he is uh, uh, head of retina services at i foundation coimbatore again a very prolific surgeon and he has lot of experience in pdr surgeries and uh, so he'll be uh, talking about bleeding and how to control hemorrhage then we have uh, dr raja rami reddy from uh, hyderabad he is a uh, uh, director and again a very experienced uh, retina surgeon uh, at hyderabad he has a huge amount of experience in handling most complex uh, pdr cases so i think thank you dr reddy for joining us so uh, we'll be taking you through this course and we'll try to keep it as interactive as possible uh, 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 luckily we have uh, 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 full house uh, because it's a morning time so we can afford to have uh, you know uh, more time spent on discussion rather than we telling you things you ask us things so i think we'll start with our first presentation over to you dr ajay can you please switch the slides yeah thank you good morning everyone so i will be speaking on the role of anti vegfs in pdr uh, just uh, stop you a second uh, will we have a key yeah it's good morning again so we all know that ppv is the gold standard for management of uh, complications of pdr however in many cases intraoperative hemorrhage may make the uh, surgery long tedious and prevent its successful completion the clots are usually sticky and their removal may create uh, retinal breaks uh, prolonged elevation of iop may hamper which cause corneal edema and uh, may even compromise the perfusion of possibly already ischemic optic nerves uh, the excessive endodiathermy may lead to necrosis and shrinkage of retina uh, and as we can see there is a little more bleeding and the clots are sticky and difficult to remove and trying to remove the clot we can see the new bleeders are coming and uh, these bleeders are difficult to stop so this was a case of well done prp so i didn't give prior anti vege but that proved to be mistake i had to raise bottle height to control the bleeding otherwise ever since i started using anti vegefs i haven't needed to uh, like raise the bottle height i avoid doing that uh, because of the risk of to optic nerve now we are doing ilem peeling the ilem is very adherent as we can see but it helps us dissect 
the membranes which are otherwise not possible and remove the residual hyloid completely. You can see we have done almost uh, peeled the uh, almost all the ILM and it's better controlled now. Sorry, I think. Still, uh, we can see nasally a residual membrane is still present, probably left behind the uh, residual clot where ILM maybe wasn't removed. So, uh, any method that can induce regression of muscularization, reducing intraoperative hemorrhage, uh, may facilitate an easier vitreoretinal surgery. And we all know that regression of neovascularization can be achieved by anti -VGFs. So, intravitreal pre-op anti uh, uh, have become a popular adjunct and supported by various studies as described below. Uh, how does it help? So, it helps by reducing intraoperative bleeding during dissections and segmentation delamination, thereby allowing better visibility, easier dissections, reduced clot formations, and all these uh, help uh, uh, like reduce the risk of retinal tears, uh, thus reducing the need of silicon oil tamponade, recurrent surgeries, etc. The reduced need of diathermy reduces the cost of retinal ischemia and scarring, and smoother surgery leads to less inflammation and better BCBA. We can see the bleeding is very well controlled, it's negligible. The ILM peeling helps us to dissect the NVCs uh, where the plane of dissection is difficult to found. We can see the, and, uh, this NVC was left behind, but uh, with ILM peeling, it's, it has been isolated. We also advocate ILM peeling in uh, uh, cases of NVCs which are within or uh, near the arcades. Uh, as first it helps reduce traction on macula and it also uh, prevents development of future ERMs. So this is a case uh, without pre-op uh, pre anti and we can see excessive diathermy has led to numerous vascular occlusions and fibrous scarring, whereas this case with pre-op anti has cleaned retina uh, and without significant vascular compromise. So before, before discussing the timing, we need to know about anti crunch syndrome. It's the development or progression of TRD following intravitreal anti in an IV with PDR typically manifest sudden, uh, with uh, sudden loss of vision about 3 to 31 days following anti of injection. The TRD develops because uh, uh, due to fibrosis and it's been found that retinal fibrosis in patients with PDR correlates with concentrations of connective tissue growth factor. The increase in CTGF levels or uh, decrease in VGF levels, that is increased CTGF uh, VGF ratio, uh, may lead to a tilt in the angiofibrotic switch towards fibrosis. And this probably explains increased fibrosis post anti -VGFs. The aggravating factors according to some uh, studies are the use of higher doses of anti -VGF injections, especially bevacizumab, severe PDR, especially with pre-existing fibrosis, and absence of prior PRP. This is an example of Crunch syndrome in left eye. The patient had a history of anti VGF elsewhere five weeks before presenting to us. The patient was not fit for surgery then, and the uh, injecting ophthalmologist was of the opinion that maybe anti VGF will keep the disease controlled till the patient is fit for the surgery. So it's important to be aware of the risk of Crohn's syndrome while deciding the time gap between the anti VGF and the surgery. Uh, in a meta analysis, of 26 RCTs, Wang et al. concluded that anti of pretreatment at preoperatory 6 to 14 days showed the best efficacy in terms of improving BCVA, reducing duration and, uh, of surgery and incidence of post-op hemorrhages, and it also reduced uh, bleeding to significant extent. Uh, but it's important to note, I think, that uh, eight out, out of these 26 trials were from China alone, so maybe uh, the 6 to 14 days period is not what we follow here. These are the detailed 
uh, study results in tabulated form. Uh, as per our personal experience, um, we may wait for a few weeks in presence of non-resolving vitreous hemorrhage or uh, recurrent vitreous hemorrhages uh, without any significant traction. But for TGRDs, it's safer to operate within two to seven days. Yes, the most important thing is uh, to get surgical fitness before giving anti-VEGF because that sometimes creates problems. Many times general ophthalmologists inject and refer to via surgeons and uh, the patient is not fit for surgery and uh, that uh, becomes a trouble for us. We can see bleeding, there is little bit of bleeding and this is pre uh, post op one day like uh, the anti vegf was given one day before only. There is some bleeding but still it's uh, not interfering with our segmentations and deliminations. We are able to peel the membrane even without significant trouble and the result was good. So in the end, uh, yeah, I also prefer repeat anti vegf at the end of surgery as it reduces early post of vitreous hemorrhage, reduces inflammation, gives better media clarity, reduces DME, and gives better visual outcome with happier patients. So, uh, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Excellent. Extensively covered all relevant points uh, related to pre-operative nt -VEGFs. So, most of us would uh, are like following your approach only that nt -VEGFs before almost all diabetic surgeries. So, let me ask you, when do you don't give uh, nt -VEGF before your PDR surgeries? What are the cases? Like uh, earlier, I avoided nt -VEGFs in presence of uh, uh, like well done PRP and if I saw like scars like whitish scars mainly not uh, too vascular but right now if i'm sure the patient is fit for surgery i even prefer giving anti vegf before surgery it's always helpful it further reduces uh, the bleeding the, and i uh, always inject at the end of surgery too many are not injecting but this is my personal opinion because it i've seen the chances of post uh, surgery vitreous hemorrhage in early post operative at least like sometimes we see the media is not clear for some days uh, after surgery and uh, rarely I uh, like I had to go in again and like inject silicone oil when I didn't inject anti vegf at the end. So these cases have reduced significantly in my practice like negligible. Okay. In last uh, five to seven years I like injected silicone oil in only one patient. Okay, oh, PDR. Thank you. So that's maybe I am dealing with less complex cases, but yeah, still. Yeah, uh, Doctor Reddy, your experience uh, like uh, on this, uh, uh, do you still go ahead and inject uh, uh, pre-operative anti vegf if uh, you see a regressed retinopathy and you uh, or like you choose your cases? Choose selectively the cases and in case of uh, ultrasound, when I what I don't inject when I don't see, I don't see only when I, there is TRDs active NVE, uh, there uh, any regress purely fibrous proliferation, I don't see any point in giving. So selectively, uh, if you see, even in vitreous hemorrhage, if I'm not seeing what is there at the band, I'm not, I don't inject anti of uh, and do his injection. Only when I see a TRD with active new vessels, uh, I'll show uh, that are likely to be, then we give. And if there is a pure fibrous element, then again, we don't give anti before uh, surgery. Yeah, quick Any questions? words on the choice of anti uh, It's now it's Renibizumab because uh, of problems with Avastin and these molecules, but earlier I used to give Bevacizumab only. Pre-op, uh, that's 1.25 mg, and intra-op, I uh, used to give double the dose, uh, like at the end of surgery, because of early washout. So many people I saw in Uretna. Yeah. And so I think if you are uh, like, uh, let's say if you are uh, operating seven days after anti-VEGF, then also you will prefer to give a post uh, in post operative uh, uh, anti vegf yeah i prefer because of uh, because in diabetics uh, either you give trimsulon at the end of surgery i avoid that because of risk of raised diop had to face in some patients so i prefer giving anti repeat anti vegf only okay fine great so i think in interest so of time, control uh, inflammation also and that's like I'm, yeah fair uh, point I 
especially if you see macular edema then i think yeah, it's it definitely is like my and everything Great. I think so we'll, I'll invite Dr. Raja Rami Reddy. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. In the interest of time, we'll if we get more time, I think you can uh, put it. that. Where do we start from? I think not all cases are same. Uh, you open up an eye with PDR, and every case uh, seems to be different. So where do we start? I, shall we start from center or periphery? Dr. Reddy is going to make us wiser. Thank you, Dr. Devendra, for making me part of this course. Uh, this talk has helped me sort out my videos, and uh, I'll be talking about how to find this uh, starting point and planes, right planes, so that you avoid the most problems in this most difficult surgery uh, of all in uh, uh, vitrectomies. So, the, where do where do we start depends on the status of the PVD, whether this previous PRP has been done on the extent of tractional retinal detachment, and also if, when the PVD is present, the extent of PVD, the configuration of the PVD, and the areas of attachment, the, uh, strong uh, strong areas of attachment of this PVD, and the strength of these additions. So, these are the tools that we that probably require to handle all. Uh, Diabetic vitrectomies. I don't think uh, cutter that will be a 25 gauge cutter. The forceps, scissors, PFCL, uh, brilliant blue, and chandelier. I don't think will require any further. And of course, a spatula. Yeah, 25 gauge spatula shall be discussed. Spatula is one instrument that is uh, that uh, very fond of, and it, it it's avoided. Give uh, it helps in finding the right planes, makes space uh, so that you can your cutter can be inserted and. Uh, uh, and it can avoid uh, bimanual surgery in fair number of cases. Uh, this is 25 gauge available in 25 and 23 gauge. And previously, the visco dissection and all things uh, are uh, proportional reflex. These are the things that are, have become redundant if you have a spatula in hand, and that can uh, help you in all. Uh, they will not be need for uh, this uh, proportional reflex and visco dissection. This is another sometimes in during the bleeding and all if you do an interface with check me you'll again find the right planes where you can uh, to help visualize the vitreous as you can see the vitreous gets highlighted like this if they work under air and you realize that that is area where vitreous is left behind and you can do more with me at that place so in between during surgery if you switch to air that will help you deal identify the planes the surgery and green blue is something that is uh, uh, that stains the ILM as well as that's and also the vitreous. So it's if you use liberally in during your surgery, it, uh, it's also a good thing that can uh, make your life uh, easier instead of triumphs and loan because this stains the ILM as well. And uh, so you have the double advantage with blue. And uh, in, when you're doing when you're planning for surgery, it's important about to know where to start and also which membrane to handle last. So in this kind of membrane, you know, this is the large membrane that you see down, that is where probably will require bimanual surgery. So it's better you handle that last and finish all the membranes and then come to the finally to this membrane. So you, instead of trying to directly go and uh, dice, trying to remove the densest membrane, mo most adherent membrane. And starting at the disc, when, the, where the, where, when there is no retinal detachment surrounding it, is the most uh, best place to do your uh, dissection. And then, uh, but there are many other ways in uh, different case scenarios. So it's always good to go and with the uh, without any uh, premediated uh, surgical behavior. And it's always good to uh, know that when there are large membranes like this, it's good to divide them and uh, handle each membrane separately rather than trying to do n block dissection of all the membranes together. So if we can divide these membranes into multiple 4-5 pieces and then uh, handle each membrane differently that will be more easier even if there a break happens uh, in handling of membrane it is limited to that particular quadrant and you the rest of the surgery in the other quadrants of the retina the is not so affected so if you can divide and then proceed with the dissection of the membranes that's uh, that's the better way of going rather than in block dissection Yeah, this is the other uh, small thing that I was saying is this lawnmower approach when there is uh, when you don't have any purchase behind a membrane, a broad membrane like this, and an adherent retina is not detached, 
and if it is a detached retina i know you have to go to bimanual surgery if it is attached retina and there is a broad dense membrane like this uh, and we don't have any purchase of going behind the membrane in these cases this is these are the kind of situations where you would try to go do a uh, try to do a lawn mower approach you keep your cutter tip just at the membrane and then take it horizontally uh, across the membrane and cutting the membrane into half this word doing all the instruments but we cannot get any enough purchase to go beneath the membrane and remove it underlying retina is relatively flat this is when we would use this uh, like how we seen yeah and this is where you put the cutter at the edge and just try to take it through and dividing the membrane once the membrane is divided it's handling the other two pieces of the membrane is relatively easier Okay, now this is a case where we'll be starting uh, experience about uh, how to start this is a case where you do not see any anatomical landmarks, where is the disc or the macula and uh, interoperatively we'll the, find out, well, the only way you can find out is this yellow pigment, yellow pigment where it is there, uh, relative on the, on the few meters away you probably guess there is a disc and that's where you start your dissection and uh, by pulling the membrane above and then putting a small PFCL bubble and uh, this is a spatula being used to uh, to clear to make way for the cutter so that it can to know that there is uh, the clear route and then start your dissection so so in this way we can uh, and there are no anatomical landmarks macula and then guess the way the disc is there and then start the this is a post-operative appearance of the re relaxing retinectomy is required. This to it is uh, uh, released and is again we have to cut this membrane into pieces so that uh, you know the handling the dissection becomes easier. So this spatula being used to uh, make way and then the membranes are cut and then this, now these two membranes again will require a bimanual surgery. Uh, this is a post-surgery post surgery of this same patient and uh, PFCL spatula and cutter assisted delamination is the best way to this com complicated membranes and when the purchase is not when you cannot get behind the membrane from uh, from posterior anterior you can try from anterior posterior uh, there is a space in that direction and then go ahead idea is Uh, to keep bimanual surgery, avoid bimanual surgery as much as possible. That was how I used to do. And uh, this is a cutter opening, uh, can be done with the hyoid if you do not have enough purchase with the forceps. You can find the edge at one place here, change the cutter direction, and then hyoid can be opened with the cutter like this. If you do not find enough uh, and it's difficult to use the di uh, forceps in this patient because you may inadvertently create breaks nasal to the disc in some kind of cases where the additions are very strong yeah this is another there's a case of a uh, one-eyed patient this is a tractional retinal detachment with disc with membrane uh, starting from the disc and going superiorly It's important that the, when before handling the membrane, the vitrectomy is complete and look for any vitreoschitic membranes and uh, complete the vitrectomy. And this this membrane dissection, you have to be you we cannot start from the disc because you're uh, likely uh, you have to start from where the membrane is starting from the inferior arcade and then go towards the epicenter that is there superiorly. PFC inserting a PFCL bubble and helps in stabilizing the dissection. This is a post-operative appearance of the same patient. And this is a toughest of all cases where there is no PVD. So and there is angry looking new vessels and there is fractional retinal detachment. This is the kind of cases would involve give an anti of prior to uh, vitrectomy. And uh, we start again from the disc, make an opening into the hyaloid. 
and then exchange this this membrane that you see temporarily that again has to be handled last and uh, start with the pvd and finish uh, extend it anteriorly to the the entire retina uh, in all quadrants and this particular membrane where it is there adjacent to the macula that probably needs to be handled last because if you go there first because there is no pvd at all in the rest of the quadrant and if some uh, problem happens in that dissect in the entire surgery gets compromised so once pvd is extended in all quadrants and uh, lastly we go to this membrane And this is our post-operative appearance, and uh, this is an, uh, this is where I've discussed again. Start. Yeah. And so this is a membrane that we should keep it for uh, by manual surgery and not try to attempt. Uh, uh, doing it without uh, by manual surgery and dividing and conquering the the other smaller membranes using span yeah this is another i'll stop with this after this video this is a case of uh, uh, diabetic treatment knife trd and uh, with uh, trd and secondary regmatinous rd adjacently and so in this, this is a case, kind of cases where you can safely induce uh, vitreous detachment from the areas that are not detached. So the areas of the retina where the uh, retina uh, vitreous can be detached safely, aggressively, and then extended towards the uh, towards the optic disc, and then the surgery can be completed. Rather than starting from the disc, you can uh, induce PVD safely from all the other quadrants, and then surgery can be. Uh, completed. Yeah. 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 This is again a uh, case where this membrane, particular membrane, has to be handled. All there is no PVD in the rest of the retina. Okay, ready. We are yeah. uh, running short Thank of you. time. Yep. Like they are good videos. Uh, even we want you to continue, but in the interest of time, we'll yeah, thank you. And Dr. Jatinder, your, your take. Excellent up here, but uh, just in the interest of time. Uh, one technique that I follow is uh, to use uh, hard tip extrusion cannula. Uh, so th this hard tip extrusion cannula uh, can be targeted uh, because you have a focused uh, kind of uh, traction at the vitreous. And choose the area where there is no traction or there is uh, like uh, very few fibrovascular stumps and uh, once the PVD is induced sometimes the subhyloid hemorrhage in that area can give you a guide it keeps on extending and it gives you a guide to uh, the extent of PVD that is happening and you can continue that uh, towards the detached retina and then start making one the other thing that I do is make an opening into the posterior hyloid as early as possible so that gives you a resistance that the fluid that is going inside kind of creates a blunt dissection and goes underneath that uh, true hyloid space and then can kind of give you a kind of third hand uh, even with without bimanual sometimes you are able to complete the surgery. Uh, Dipinder, any, any points on you want to add? So what is your choice of tamponade and when you decide about uh, putting like in which cases you would want to put oil or the case is sometimes you actually do a very good dissection where you tend to decide you put a gas but you may have an indolent uh, or a, a break which you have not seen. So and at times these patients have a blood stain with this cavity that we actually not see the retina. And sometimes it may come after a month or so where you are actually seeing a detached retina. So what are the pointers you would want to say? Interoperative hemostasis is good. I mean, you have the, at the towards the end of surgery, you feel there is no bleeding is happening, and uh, and uh, 
that, then that case we put in gas. In, in cases where we expect some amount of, uh, the, at the end of surgery there is some blood clot that you have left that uh, that is not removed that you could not be removed at the cases we put in uh, silicon oil. Silicon oil is not just for the case of tamponade, it's for the case that they need to be visually be rehabilitated slightly early. So my choice depends on whether the, at the end of surgery it is clean, the field is clean, there is no bleeding and there is no choice and uh, all bleeders are complete. In those cases we put in gas. So these sometimes because of some focal traction you would see the retina is elevated. So whether do you put no, no, they will not be required to. Uh, if the traction is relieved, I think all they'll uh, they, they'll settle with on their own. Uh, the gas. There is no need to put in gas just because there is some elevated rate now. There is no retinogenous component. I think safely we can put in gas. Many of the times, in spite of being oil, many of the the SRF is still there. At the time of oil removal, also sometimes the SRF is still there. So having slightly elevated rate now is not an indication to put in gas. Uh, I just like to add in that that there are there are few uh, surgeons who choose to in, uh, do the surgery in two steps. So when you are dealing with the complicated that uh, cases that we are discussing uh, today, uh, always advise the patient that he might need two surgeries. And uh, whenever there is uh, like large sticky clots, you are not able to do a complete removal, inject gas and sometimes uh, short term PFCL tamponade and uh, do a lavage later on and then inject oil. The problem with oil is that with these sticky clots, the fibrocellular proliferation, a lot of traction and then that contracture that uh, will get into the retina. That intrinsic contracture of the retina is then going to cause breaks even if you do not have intraoperative breaks. And that becomes a messy affair later on. Uh, Dr. Dipinder, our chief instructor will take the next talk. Uh, in interest of time, uh, because very interesting discussion, we could have extended it. Temponard uh, is always a uh, so I think I'll uh, start from where Dr. Reddy has uh, left, uh, and a lot of points he has very well covered also. Uh, but why why we need uh, biomanual dissections uh, in PDR surgery? Because there are two things we are worried when we are addressing these cases. One is a retinal tear, and second is bleeding. If you see, these are two core issues, and uh, uh, I think. Tear normally happens whenever, whether it is spontaneous or hydrogenic, it will almost always happen at the base of uh, neovascular complex or around that neovascularization because retina around it is ischemic and more fragile and traction is strongest at, at that point. The adhesion between vitreous and retina is strongest at the neovascular complex. And if you see, this is just a spontaneous uh, uh, break, it is at the base of neovascular complex and uh, when you are operating these cases, uh, I think Dr. Reddy has already laid out that your strategy is to, uh, you know, uh, address uh, it from outside and leave the thickest membranes at the end. Uh, so, I will just uh, taking it forward from there. So, this was again a very aggressive PDR, uh, uh, TRD in a uh, young patient. Now, if you see, uh, this is actually an unedited video. I'll I'll just try to show that when we are discussing that you are going biomanual and you are trying to go around the neovascularizations, not disturbing them. What do we mean? So when we are starting, you just transect the weakest connection, the thinnest connection between neovascular complexes, and spend some time when you before you start and you realize that thickest and the whitest portions are the areas where you have strongest and biggest neovascularizations. So, try to dissect in between these uh, islands. I usually call them islands or pegs and uh, separate them uh, from each other. And biomanual actually makes your job easier, uh, faster and safer. So, I would rather recommend uh, going biomanual for all these TRDs. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, I think it's worth it. And you can combine multiple forceps. You can combine uh, uh, forceps with the uh, cutter. You can combine diathermy with laser. You can combine uh, as aspiration with cutter, depending on the situation. So it actually uh, uh, adds a lot of hands uh, to your armamentarium when you are biomanual. And again, just like what Dr. Reddy was showing that First you separate the bigger islands from each other and then you start addressing each 
bigger island and try to make smaller islands out of that anyway we are in the city of islands right now so we have to create these islands uh, when you are doing these pdr surgeries with trds and this video i have chosen just to show you that a thick fibrovascular membrane is actually composed of so many neovascular complexes you see all these white white lesions in retina they were all neovascular complexes which have joined to form a thick fibrous uh, uh, fibrovascular membrane so idea of doing operating them is to i think bring it back to where it started it started with these neovascularizations so separate them from each other and create these islands you will see in the end and in in a in post operative picture also you see all these residual stumps of neovascular complexes they are harmless and and if they are encroaching posterior pole dr ajay would be speaking about it an additional maneuver you can do is peel the ilm so that they, when they regress further they will not exert traction on macula now these things are little different from our conventional pdr surgeries when we were operating them at the later stages when we were doing heavy prp neovascularization used to regress here we are operating on neovascularizations which are still regressing and they are still active so even when you have uh, done your surgeries they will keep on regressing in the post operative period they will increase the traction so that's why probably ilm peeling and creating the smaller islands is good enough and my colleague uh, i'll show you fic a uh, few pictures at the end of presentation uh, this is another uh, case similar uh, you see the thick fibrovascular sheet and i just wanted to this is for the interest of fellows that how do you decide where to put chandelier this is again a, a important part uh, now you put your three ports put your endolite and examine the retina and see where is your core pathology where will be your main dissection and just opposite like in this case it was in this temporal area this is the right eye so this is the temporal area so i am putting the chandelier diagonally opposite to that but sometimes if you have a nasal membrane then don't do that then do just opposite put chandelier temporal and sometimes you have pathologies in multiple quadrants you can always rotate the chandelier also don't hesitate these are all 25 gauge ports you can create as many and you they close spontaneously so if you have more than one pathology you need not have two three somebody suggested have two chandeliers three chandeliers you don't need i think you, you will be addressing each pathology one at a time so you can shift them so uh, rest is same uh, i think all our vr colleagues colleagues are now addressing these similarly we don't try to peel these new vascular complexes we just segment and break them into multiple small islands and disc is often a good uh, point where, where you will always find a plane uh, so that's the only area where we can peel off and create a plane and then start segmenting again yeah i think there, there is a video missing here but uh, again i wanted to show here in this video was that sometimes uh, a very clean looking case vitreous hemorrhage you start operating it remove dense vitreous hemorrhage and in the end you realize there is a foveal neovascularization which is tightly adherent then also you don't hesitate to shift to a bimanual mode you insert a chandelier and then because it is much safer to handle a foveal neovascularization bimanually rather than uh, doing it unimanually you can actually uh, segment uh, around it now uh, this was again a case where i just wanted to show that trd progressing and we operated and these are all residual neovascular complexes now a colleague asked me uh, this question you are leaving these neovascular complexes stumps what happens to them in long run so i tried to take out uh, all all these cases and just to show you that they regress and if you have peel ilm they maintain good vision macula stays healthy so i think you don't need to uh, disturb them a lot just segment it from segment them from each other another case you see uh, segmentation and long term follow up even with this kind of uh, large uh, areas which have been dissected from posterior pole they are very well tolerated so to conclude i think uh, we should try to plan most of our pdr trds as a bimanual surgeries as i already highlighted use forceps with cutters spatulas long 26 gauge needles you can combine them identify the thickest neovascular complex separate it from all those uh, other smaller uh, epicenters and leave the thickest part at the for, for the end first you approach the larger islands and then uh, uh, separate them from each other and then you can come back to each island and make small islands out of that 
so uh, with this i think i'll conclude and i can take questions if there are any thank you Dr. Pindar, I mean, regarding the islands, I mean, the the first video that showed that quite, I mean, with the 25 gauge, you can reduce the size further, yes. also, and uh, that. Uh, absolutely, I absolutely. think uh, it's more. Uh, it's all about patience. Smaller islands you create, better would be the results. And closer the islands are to posterior pole, try to make them smaller. Smaller. And the nasal ones, you can still leave them the bigger as bigger islands. Mm -hmm. But uh, if they are in the posterior pole and macular area, try to. I almost separate all smallest smallest new vessels from each other mm -hmm. and there is always a plane in, in between two new vascular complexes all we need is more patience and uh, you know uh, we have to spend some more time and you will find a plane and if you are not getting plane from one particular clock arc uh, approach it from the other side you will find a plane uh, diagonally opposite i think one thing uh, i would want to reemphasize again is uh, once the instrument is being tried to insinuate, you are trying to insinuate the instrument uh, behind that fibrovascular stock and don't try to lift it directly vertically up. You should yeah. try go around because many a times this, there is a fine flimsy membrane which will continue extended uh, towards the periphery. So you make a curvilinear motion rather than a direct motion towards the stock. So make sure that the stumps are all isolated and there is no uh, second membrane between them. So second membranes, if they are there, these stumps will cause problems. Right. I agree. Yes. I think, uh, I think uh, Dr. Ajay, you can take that mic. If you can come you can here, use the mic, sir. Uh, Dr. Ajay. Hello. Uh, just that uh, uh, if you are not finding the plane, it's too difficult. Uh, and then we can try island peeling surrounding that. Wherever island is sta gets stained, we can peel. And with that, we will get that plane, definitely. Almost always, we will get a plane to lift up. Uh, that so uh, excellent point i agree fully agree with this yes sir you had a question so if you're a right-handed surgeon how do you dissect your left eye nasal trds and membranes uh, i think most of us uh, are now ampidextrous and i encourage fellows especially in vr surgery uh, i think we do ilm peelings also with left hand and all the dissections uh, you can be slower than when you are doing it with your do dominant hand uh, but I think this is something one has to practice. Uh, otherwise, I think uh, you can still uh, do it, but I think the safety gets better if you are able to shift hands. In interest of time, I have not shown uh, this that how shifting, maybe I think in the next video I will show uh, my next presentation that you have to shift your hands. Sometimes you have to shift from right to left and left to right. You can shift your ports also. I think surgeons have to improvise when uh, we are doing PDR surgeries. Maybe Dr. Eddie can. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's uh, you asked regarding the question: How do you handle the nasal, nasal membranes? Yeah, in a left eye for a right hand surgeon. So, uh, apart, you have to uh, use bimanual surgery. I mean, you have to be ambidextrous to in some way or the other. To you can shift the microscope temporarily, like the cataract yeah, surgeons do. You can sit yeah. temporarily and approach it this way. I think uh, most of the times we will peel off from the disc unless it is a isolated uh, NVD and there is no traction in surrounding area. Peeling at disc normally we exploit this only when we, there is a uh, traction in the adjacent area especially the macular area and you are not able to find the plane like Dr. Mm -hmm. Reddy shown, uh, has shown beautifully in his video. Then disc is probably I think area where you can just peel the NVD and then just extend it little bit before it reaches uh, the uh, next, uh, the closest neovascular complex. Don't try to peel it from there, you will have a posterior pole break. So the whole idea is around a half disc diameter area around disc is quite safe. It's very rare to have a neovascular complex in that close vicinity of disc, especially on the temporal sides and superior and inferior. So that is what we exploit sometimes. One important Actually, point, uh, I think, uh, shifting the chandeliers is uh, in MIBS we have a great advantage or uh, we can put a chandelier in any of the any ports of even 23G ports we can put a 25G chandelier I've done it many times and it's very easy I even change infusion many times actually and creating also, all these island and herbal supplements uh, if there are very if there is a very high risk of bleeding you probably need to take uh, opinion from the physician and uh, stop them uh, in time certain medications uh, it's okay to stop three days 
some medications like warfarin has to be stopped five days before surgery. Uh, Pre-operative inflammation uh, has to be controlled with topical steroids, uh, sometimes an extended cataract surgery. Uh, if, if there is too much inflammation, colon edema, it is better to defer the surgery uh, rather than taking it in the, uh, in the planned combined surgery manner. The vascularity of the fibrovascular proliferation, as we have already discussed, uh, tackled with the intravital avastin three to five days prior. And uh, in case there is vitreous hemorrhage and no view of the retina, I take uh, the ultrasound picture into consideration looking into the extent of VR attachment and then decide whether I, whether or not I, whether or not I need to give a vest in pre-op. So, um, sorry. So, that there are other intraoperative factors, uh, patients who are anxious and uh, claustrophobic uh, right at the start, as soon as you put their drape, they will uh, complain and this kind of, uh, uh, we have to take uh, their uh, comfort level uh, into consideration first. And uh, good communication uh, avoids uh, problem, good communication with the patient and the anesthetist if the patient is under GA. Interoperative hypertension always have a monitor on. Uh, look uh, for the BP. If there is a high increase in BP interoperatively, uh, I have uh, sometimes given sublingual dip in interoperative as well. The ambient temperature of the operating room, uh, if it creates hypothermia, we know that hypothermia delays uh, coagulation. That has to be also uh, have uh, taken into consideration. And uh, if there is high risk of uh, bleeding that you are expecting, uh, in that case, you uh, probably should not use uh, the regular BSS, use the BSS plus uh, without citrate or the lactator ringers. Uh, I am very fond of using chilled infusion bottles. So I keep the bottle uh, in the fridge uh, for at least eight hours, usually the previous night. And I do these cases uh, first uh, case of the day. Uh, so the chilled infusion not only creates a good hemostasis but also increases the tolerance uh, to ischemia. The, the retina, uh, retinal tolerance to ischemia is much better when the infusion bottles are, uh, is chilled. In some cases, you can use epinephrine uh, uh, within the in the uh, ringer lactate uh, infusion bottle. The surgical care we all understand as from the previous talks. Proper understanding of anatomy and the clean identification of the surgical uh, plane is uh, imperative. Uh, plasma knife, there are surgeons who use that. It gives a cold cutting and uh, creates coagulation as you cut it uh, without creating much of traction. So once the breeder uh, is there, it takes it some time for the clot to start. And these are the steps that you can take uh, to induce coagulation. Uh, increasing the hydrostatic pressure is usually the immediate uh, first knee jerk response. Uh, we create uh, IOP elevation either with uh, the gravity induced elevation of the bottle or with the VGFI system that the new metrectomy machines allow us. Uh, in induced coagulation with the help of endothermy or endophotocoagulation. Compartmentalization uh, with the use of air, gas, uh, uh, viscoelastics, other substances and form of coagulation. We'll just uh, talk about these. Uh, interoperative bleeding can be graded as mild, moderate, severe. I'll not go into the details here. This is the first video uh, just to show you uh, you're dealing with a very peripheral traction and immediately there is a bleed. Increase the bottle height immediately to 60, even 80, uh, sometimes even 100. And uh, it will take hardly a minute or two for the coagulation uh, for the bleeding to stop once the media is cleared. Uh, the breeders are, uh, uh, it's, it's a large breeder, then you immediately go in and diathermize that breeder. Uh, so, the th things that you note, uh, need to note is when the hydrostatic uh, in compression of the severe uh, blood vessel is uh, induced by increasing, uh, increasing the IOP, the vitrector has to be off. If the vitrector is on and continuously uh, having a vacuum mode on, it will uh, not create, create the kind of uh, IOP that you want to have. Uh, ports have to be closed and if there is a mismatch of the ports or uh, leaking valve cannulas, make sure that the, can the cannula is are plugged. And it is always better to have an audio feedback where some machines uh, don't give you the time that the tamponade is kept on and that can cause uh, ischemic damage, uh, which is sometimes irreversible. So the compromised optic nerve head and uh, retinal circulation is the main uh, like, uh, con uh, concern here. And also think if the cannulas are open, uh, overused cannulas or non-valved cannulas, if there is a very high uh, 
uh, infusion pressure uh, it can create jet stream injury sometimes the retina is atrophic and you can have atrogenic break uh, diagonally opposite to the infusion port uh, there are certain authors who believe in hyperinfusion vitrectomy uh, they increase the iop 80 to 100 uh, or even more and uh, they, even up to 10 minutes they found that their results uh, anatomical and functional results were better than the historical uh, controls that they had uh, and, and it is published so direct compression in olden era uh, we used to have this hemostopper but uh, in newer uh, uh, systems with uh, val cannulas uh, you can use any blunt tip instrument directly go and give a gentle pressure not uh, too much of pressure uh, so that the rp uh, doesn't get damaged in that area and uh, that induces vascular spasm and in addition to the increased bottle height uh, creates a good uh, uh, clotting so increase uh, induce coagulation with the help of endotheliotomy uh, the uh, the bi manual approach or the uni manual but the port the the diathermy uh, probe should be always bipolar this so as to so as to avoid the the current or the endo endo that that uh, electromagnetic uh, current flowing through the optic nerve head uh, that may act as a sink especially if you are uh, inducing coagulation close to the posterior pole then multifunction probes plasma knife and fugo blades uh, also can be used the problem with the diathermy is sometimes the port uh, the clots may stick to the port so you should allow ample time for the cooling uh, with the infusion Uh, so that the port, the port or the probe uh, separates from the clot on its own, and do not try to pull it on the clot. So this is uh, an island peeling uh, done. There is a small ooze uh, in this area, and uh, it was just. So you not actually go and touch. You can use a very high uh, current, like forty forty percent or fifty percent power, and uh, create uh, the diathermy uh, zone. Uh, even without touching the bleeder directly you can induce coagulation um dr dipender is very fond of this uh, endophotocoagulation uh, creating uh, direct uh, 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 clot over the uh, flat but the retina here it has to be flat and the view has to be absolutely clear and uh, he what he does is actually charge the entire retina uh, or the bleed at the site of the severed vessel and uh, he feels that the uh, the results are quite good uh, i don't have that video on the page so uh, the uh, the diathermy sometimes has to has to be done in a staged manner so what uh, i do is i raise the bottle height uh, if required up to 100 uh, the bot the, there has to be complete cessation of bleeding from all the bleeding uh, bleeders and then slowly diathermize the one which open first and gradually keep on reducing the infusion pressure to 90 80 70 and as you reduce it more and more bleeders uh, open up some not all bleeders will open up at a given at a set uh, temp, uh, set uh, uh, infusion so this allows you good time you can uh, deal, uh, deal them one by one just sit like a sniper and as soon as uh, some enemy pops up uh, you can just shoot it down so this is uh, something which is uh, very helpful so compartmentalization can is basically you create a, a, a area or a, the the environment that the fluid and blood doesn't mix together uh, so you can use air you can use viscoelastic pfcl or silicon oil so basically at the site of the severed vessel the clotting factors are just flowing off because of the infusion uh, get, going in and uh, these uh, uh, options give you the option uh, the uh, situation that you can let the clotting factors remain at the severed vessel site and uh, it allows good uh, coagulation it takes around 4 to 5 minutes at the most so these are various setups you can use a regular bss and uh, switch in the pfcl infusion uh, you can also use uh, the pfcl per fluoro dissection and uh, these are uh, pdas with multiple bleeds i will not i'll skip this video and uh, talking about just ph pharmaco uh, modulation there are certain substances like thrombin and hemocoagulase which can be used in the infusion bottle to give you coagulation in patients who are where you are expecting a uh, lot of bleeding the problem with this is that uh, there can be inflammation in around 1/5 of the cases and the clots that form later on are quite sticky 
so most of the cases are managed uh, with topical steroids and uh, last but not the least i would want to highlight the importance of trimsinone we use it as an agent to identify the vitreous but in, uh, in addition to that the interspersed layer of trimsinone which is uh, over lying over the retina will not allow the clot to stick onto the retina so the retina many times uh, which is atrophic once you're trying to remove this clot it will give way and create hydrogenic break so this trimsinone layer in between can act like a barrier between the two uh, it also gives you anti inflammatory and anti angiogenic uh, benefits it stabilizes the vessels and uh, creates mechanical sedimentation of little bit of uh, rbcs that are left in the cavity so i'll uh, just leave with this video on and we can take questions from you thank you so much thank you dr jatinder for comprehensively covered presentation like just like asepsis homeostasis is also a very comprehensive approach you have to take care of uh, everything right from your perfusion pressure leaking ports and your infusion temperature and all all the things and uh, then only you can get best uh, possible hemostasis so i think we are open for questions dr reddy your take what extra yes. you you do in your practice to ensure you get uh, good hemostasis I mean, uh, yeah pardon for intraoperative monitoring of the bp of the patient that's the most important factor that causes profuse bleeding in the practice so it's it's always good to measure the blood pressure uh, during the surgery as well and in case there is high before because most of the time they dilating drops themselves they cause some blood pressure at the time of admission they may be normal but uh, soon after the at the time of block during the surgery the bp may be raised so uh, measures to decrease the blood pressure during the surgery also helps uh, decreasing the bleeding intraoperatively that's uh, most that's of the machines actually once you have put the bp on it gives you a reading and it remains there so yeah, what yeah. i instruct my uh, ot staff is every 15 minute dial system and while doing important steps make sure the anesthetist starts to give a medication to decrease the blood pressure so that you know uh, that really helps intra hypertension during the surgery and not stopping the antiplatelets uh, and in the wrong vein the most important causes for bleeding i mean they are they avoidable i guess and definitely it makes you like yeah great point i think uh, yeah suggestion but sometimes you don't have to wait for 5 days what we do is if you see more than unusual bleeding i do two things one is stop don't disturb that area and second is realize that probably there is either we have touched a normal vessel because massive bleeding will not come from a new vessel normally it comes from if you touch a new vessel or you create a break in a vascular retina so you stop there Uh, go to the other areas where you can still see start uh, 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 detaching the vitreous from the periphery finish your other work and spend and let the let do it at the higher perfusion pressure and you will realize most of the times when you come back to it after 15 minutes or so you can easily see that there is a clot which is formed and many times you can trim this clot and i'll show in one of our videos that you can use back flush to Uh, just get rid of the liquid liquefied blood around that clot it gets reduced in size and you can actually segment the clot also don't touch the new vascular area but you can actually make this clot break it into again small vas uh, clot islands and then you can uh, just use your regular tamponade that residual amount of blood clears up very well so you need not abandon surgery also if you see this kind of uh, massive bleeding most important is uh, address it especially raising the bottle height or perfusion pressure immediately when you see unusually uh, uh, see heavy bleeding if you delay then you will get a massive clot and many times you we anticipate that this case is going to have a posterior pole bleed 
So we put a PFO bubble like you see Dr. Reddy's uh, video, Dr. Jatinder also. If you feel there are big new vessels around arcade and they are going to bleed when you operate. You start your surgery after you have removed posterior highlight from the central area. Create an opening in the posterior highlight and put a PFO bubble on macula. So if, even if you have a bleeding, you will not have a massive clot on macula. So that's something you can do. I think uh, do all the three things first. Create that hydrostatic pressure, rise, uh, touch the vessel, creates a vascular spasm and use compartmentalization. Inject air, let it be there for five, five minutes or so and then reevaluate. And if you have to diathermize that area, don't diathermize directly over the vessel. Use the edge on, do it on one edge. Use 40-50% uh, uh, diathermic power and without touching the vessel, do, uh, do it at one edge. And suppose, I mean, I, and in all cases, wherever I have diathermized closer to arcades or sometimes within that uh, pristine zone, I would always peel ILM from that area. So remove the traction also from that uh, source. I think the most important point what you said is when the vitrectomy machine cutter is on, the VGFI is not working. If something is really ble bleeding, you stop everything and take out the instrument and wait for some time. Maybe that's a uh, good idea. Maybe it will come down. As long as we are doing some procedure with the vitrectomy and uh, probably VGFI is not working. Yeah, I really like the idea of chilling your, uh, keeping it in refrigerator and using a chilled, uh, I think we have never done it, yeah, but this is a good idea. Yeah, I, I one really question. do that. Uh, it works well. There's one question, please. Yeah, to Dr. Jatinder, you know, like sometimes when you cauterize too much and uh, post op later on, one and a half months, two months down the line, they sometimes develop those miniature contraction and PVR changes also. So, how do you, I mean, what's your take on that? How much do you cauterize? And More than that, in cases uh, where I'm not actually planning to use silicon oil as a tamponade, I'm uh, apprehensive that these areas may form uh, retinal necrosis induced breaks. So I always do a barrage laser at least one or two rows uh, around those uh, diathermized area. And I haven't encountered much of contracture or contracture or uh, uh, membrane are, are for, uh, result of a membrane, residual membrane that remain that area. I think the retina itself doesn't contract if there is no traction over it. So I think that's the reason uh, many times we prefer doing laser first to control these bleedings especially when you are lowering the bottle height to find out additional bleeders like Dr. Jatinda was saying that you wait like a sniper so the moment uh, this thing comes uh, the bleeding starts from a, a bleeder you do a laser it serves two purposes one is it will control it will do the coagulation part second it will take care of any small tear if you have created you know that, that sometimes a heavy bleeding is a sign that you have created a retinal tear so laser will address both with less scarring and uh, traction. But of course, not all breeders get uh, coagulated by laser because heat from laser is lesser than diacetyl. So, if it's not... If you're using laser, try to increase the duration of the burn rather than for endo PRP generally, even if you put uh, 100 milliseconds is fine. But for doing uh, coagulation, at least two 200 milliseconds is what you want. Yeah. Yeah. So, to be presented um, by Dr. Shashank, but somehow uh, uh, there is some emergency and he is unable to come. So I am presenting on my his behalf. So some of presentation is partly his. So uh, as the time is short, uh, I think I will go fast. Uh, so we can skip the uh, traditionally ILM peeling uh, was advocated uh, in presence of VMT or refractory DME, uh, but over the years. We also observed late ERM formation in some types of PDR cases undergone vitrectomy, uh, such as uh, this patient with uh, uh, macular traction. Uh, the surgery was done and everything was fine. The traction was completely released, but uh, some years later, the patient came with uh, LHEP and uh, uh, we can see the thinning. So uh, there is another patient. Uh, with uh, extensive uh, mid -peri peripheral neurosclerosis complexes. Uh, the patient developed ERM along supratumbal arcade with traction on macula. And uh, surgery was done. The macular traction was relieved, but the NVCs were too difficult to uh, remove and left alone. Uh, it has been long and uh, ever, even after uh, like many years, the patient is doing fine. Uh, 
this is another case with uh, subiloid hemorrhage and large NVD and macular uh, NV. Uh, the uh, surgery, all the traction was removed. The result was good. But after two years, the patient developed recurrent uh, NV and uh, ERMs. Here we can see. So uh, we wondered if, uh, uh, like, uh, had ILM peeling uh, was done during the initial surgery, maybe the ERMs uh, could have been prevented. So meanwhile, uh, this case came came to us. A PDR with DME was injected with azudex, but developed vitreous hemorrhage post azudex. Uh, the patient uh, got panic, so we decided to go all in. The cataract was removed in the same sitting, and uh, we can see the azudex implant. The, it was uh, difficult to find the plane of dissection of the NVD easily. So we decided to do ILM peeling first so as to release its traction over macula as well as to help uh, reduce the DME. But we can see like the here the membrane is also coming with ILM. So we are able to find the plane of dissection now. So as we can see the along with ILM, the whole uh, thick fibrovascular membrane is getting peeled off. And the NVD is now isolated. It can be trimmed easily now. So now uh, we have found the plane in all the quadrants. And we can see the uh, result is good. So what are the advantages of ILM peeling in eyes with PDR? The PDR eyes, uh, diabetic eyes uh, have high incidence of vitreous And ILM peeling makes sure that the outer layer of vitreous is removed. Moreover, the PDR eyes also have high incidence of ERMs. So ILM peel, is, uh, peel allows you to create plane for dissection and release traction of like difficult to remove neuroscular complexes on macula and surrounding retina. Reduces the incidence of post-op ERMs also. But uh, ILM peeling is not like it's traumatic also, especially in diabetic eyes because it's more adherent. Uh, we can see in this patient after ILM peeling, so, developed two breaks which are vi more visible uh, with laser now. Uh, also a study has found some deleterious effects of macular peeling on retinal microcirculation too, especially in eyes with diabetic retinopathy. So what are the ideal cases of di uh, ILM peeling in PDR? Uh, uh, as per our observation, uh, we have concluded, like uh, we advocate that all cases with NVD or NVCs within the arcades or near the arcades, and cases with ERMs or uh, VMT. Uh, all these cases have high chances of recurrent ERMs. So uh, preferably we should do ILM peeling in these cases. As you can see, there is a large inferotemporal NV. So this fits into our uh, criteria of ILM peel. Video, uh, I think it's hanging. Okay, yeah. So we did uh, peel the ILM in this case. I think I will skip it, not a very... Oops. And the results have been good so far. So this is another case uh, with a difficult to remove uh, neuroscularization along supratemporal arcade, also a large and we inferior, inferior to disc also. So we simply trimmed uh, these neuroscular fronts and peeled the ILM up to the base of these uh, NVCs. Uh, so uh, this relieves the traction uh, of NVCs at macula at least and practically our job is done. We can see the release of traction on macula and the macula is returning to normal over time. 
so uh, there are some cases where we are cautious uh, or even avoid peel uh, one important is uh, end stage pdr because the retina usually is atrophic and friable and ilm is tightly adhered moreover the fibrosis of nvc is uh, usually doesn't progress too much in such cases the only i uh, think you may miss is like uh, Miss, uh, leave a residual hyoid which may form uh, ERMs later, but that's not that important. And other scenario is where the neuroscular front is far away from macula, as in this case. The macula was free of traction, so ILM wasn't peeled, and the patient is doing well for uh, more than five years now. So, to conclude, ILM peeling is beneficial in selected cases of PDR with traction at or near macula. Uh, and a useful tip is to examine macula. Uh, by OCT in silicon roll peel dyes and peel ILM at the time of SOR if required. So, uh, in some cases, it can be done later too. Thanks. And, uh, very well, Dr. Rajay, where not to peel. I think the take home message is that uh, apart from the area, uh, it's, it always benefits the patient uh, of a PDR or DME to do ILM peeling at the time of surgery, either primary surgery or at the time of uh, removal of uh, silicon oil. Because uh, apart from decreasing the chance of rebleed, if you are doing around the NV, removing it completely, it also decreases the macular edema, which is helpful for the patient. Uh, they do better if ILM peeling is done at some point during the course of their surgery, either primary or during the silicon oil removal, if it is being planned. So, ILM peeling, uh, if it's done, it's, it's always good to be done. Question? Uh, I just have a point to make. Uh, I think we should not underestimate the uh, ill effects of ILM peeling, especially in uh, diabetic with large macular Because as it is, the uh, macular is tightening. We try to peel, it is mostly tenacious and we produce damage as well as love fiber there. Not that we don't do that, we definitely do that. But I tend to follow uh, foveal sparing ILM peeling because I have the macular hole in the most operative period, especially when the edema is out. That's something which we see commonly. So I tend to do a fovea sparing ILM peeling, whereby the forces are uh, you know, made towards the center of the fovea. And it has been described the reference of And another thing I just want to say is ILM peeling is good, especially for disc briefs. Because as you know, ILM uh, covers the macular area, but as it goes over the disc, it is again a one four thickness of ILM. It's called ILM, inner lifting membrane of the disc. So while you're peeling ILM over the foveal area towards the disc, and a thin layer over the disc also goes on. And that prevents, uh, uh, that stops the bleed. Sometimes if there is a loose recurrent, that also stops. Yeah, your point of uh, leaving the uh, like fovea sparing ILM peeling is good, but I've seen, uh, I haven't seen uh, macular hole developing in uh, diabetic PDR cases, especially, but yeah, in high myops, we have seen. I also have three cases where Barra's laser was done and in high myops, and uh, since then, in uh, retinal detachment cases, I have stopped uh, doing ILM peeling at center of fovea. I, I try to uh, leave it. Yes. Sometimes it comes together with that and I am not able to, but mostly I try to and yeah, it's the large, uh, uh, and above I think when you have cases, a, no, when you have a cystoid at fovea, yeah, I think yeah, definitely fovea bad. sparing. Mm. Off That's, late, what we have realized is if your, your macula is visible, we are using OCT NGO to decide our peeling technique. And, uh, and that's very useful. If you see a lot of uh, macular ischemia involving fovea, then I think there is definitely a case of doing a fovea sparing. And sometimes you can pick smaller uh, neovascular twigs very close to fovea. And then you go back and see your video, you will realize you are encountering more resistance in that area. There was a so such a small neovascular uh, twig that you were not able to see intraoperatively, but OCT NGO could uh, you know, show you that there was that thing. So you have to be more careful. You can create a tear. So I think uh, more we are peeling, we are uh, getting more and more informed that how do we modify our technique. But one thing is definitely I agree with you. Don't force your peeling in vascul uh, these vascular cases. It's not like your macular hole cases where you do a smooth peeling. You have to uh, you have to judge the uh, the adhesion. If ILM is not uh, is uh, more tightly adherent. 
I think suspect that something is wrong, uh, do this, spare that area rather than forcing it because tearing is very easy in uh, avascular retina as compared to healthy retina. And so you can see preoperatively, uh, you can always give steroids and defer surgery for a week yeah, or two weeks. And moreover, uh, most of us, I think, feel uh, up till the disc. And uh, only in the videos, because of short time, we have shown uh, full eye of feeling here. Yeah, yeah. But mostly, I've actually, it's very useful. Because the next after you make a move on NBD from the disc, then we have a prevalence of 5% in the prevalent of fibrous tissue there, which is actually the source of recurrent pain from there. So by feeling that ILM and taking it over the disc, you are actually removing that out. So and immediately you see that the is Yes, except sometimes we leave nasal. Uh, to disc, but otherwise inferior, superior, temporal to disc, usually we extend the billing to that area. Retinal breaks and second is clots and hemorrhages. So uh, I'll just show a couple of videos to just say that, uh, share that how to manage if you en encounter, although you tr you should try your best to avoid a hydrogenic break in PDR surgeries, but sometimes you do get it. So this video will show you why do you get it uh, and then how do you, how can you address it. Uh, this was again a PDR sub highlight hemorrhage you can see and you might wonder why we were doing surgery for this, but you can see this traction distorting fovea and uh, after anti-VEGF you can again see uh, this getting uh, worse. So this was uh, again, uh, these are rather tougher cases when you maximum retina is attached and you have a very limited uh, tractional detachment. So uh, as you will see here, yeah. So this is typically uh, that uh, uh, answer to that question. Now my right hand is holding the cutter. We are doing biomanual surgery and left eye is holding this uh, membrane and I am slowly dissecting it from retina. And now at this point when I realize that, that I am not getting the right angle, I will switch my hands and now uh, you will see I, I have cutter in my left hand and forceps in right hand. And now you see what I am doing. Even when I am biomanual, I am not biomanual. It's something like we people used to do with mask and seat belt. You have protection, but you are not using it. And you see what happens here after this. I just went with the flow and there was a tear. If I would have used forceps at this step, I would have easily avoided a hydrogenic tear. So, and you see a gush of blood coming. And when you see excessive bleeding, I think you suspect that you have created a tear. And this was definitely very thickly adherent uh, membrane. And now, uh, how do you address it is, one is you clear the traction around this. But another thing which we I learned, re, uh, I think last few years is that uh, diathermize the edges of this uh, hydrogenic tear if you get it in PDR, because last thing you want in PDR is subretinal bleed. Uh, we were all dreaded and worried about uh, vitreous cavity bleeds, but subretinal bleeding is even worse in PDR cases. So immediately you diathermize it just like you do for your reg RD cases where you do it for marking. But here it helps you, you know, most of the times this break will happen at the base of new vascular complex. So it will actually cauterize that NVC also. And uh, of course you carry on with your dissection, biomanual dissection now and separate these sheets. And now you have to be even more meticulous in separating all these sheets around this break. So the most important thing is diathermize and uh, clear the traction. And of course, I think uh, ILM peeling we have already discussed. So I'll just skip that part. And then you do laser and uh, uh, I think uh, choosing tamponade just doesn't depend on creating a break and uh, 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 tractional issues. It's also about uh, visual rehabilitation and need of that patient. Uh, if it's like one-eyed patient or you know that patient is less likely to follow up, we always choose silicon oil over gas. Rather we use gas very less in our setup, either we use air. Most of the cases where you feel like using gas, actually they don't need gas even, they need only air tamponade. Uh, but yes, if you want to give early rehabilitation, then silicon oil definitely is an advantage. And you see patient, uh, the final outcome was not compromised because of that hydrogenic break. And again, this was again a patient where you will see, uh, this was more of a 
एडवांस पी डी आर वन आई ऑलरेडी लॉस्ट एंड दिस वॉज ए कम्बाइंड डिटैचमेंट एंड अगेन द प्रिंसिपल इज सेम यू हैव टू क्रिएट मल्टीपल आईलैंड हेयर ऑल्सो इट्स जस्ट अ डिटैच रेडना विद पी डी आर सो यू विल हैव दो आईलैंड सो सेपरेट दैम फ्रॉम ईच अदर एंड अगेन समथिंग विच वी वर डिस्कसिंग पुट अ पी एफ ओ बबल एट मैक्यूला सो दैट यू विल सी लॉट ऑफ ब्लड इज एक्यूमुलेटिंग around the bubble but uh, your foveal macular area is still spared and here you see sometimes because in detached retina i think is more likely to tear up and you see a gush of bl blood and and this tear has been now created again the principle is same you dissect it from all around and you see i think if you manage it well do good laser and this amount of heme i think it clears up i think this is hardly at one week follow up so this is again something i want to share with fellows that if you have a thin layer of blood at macula or uh, uh, posterior pole need not worry you put silicon oil tamponade most of the times it clears up so uh, need not be that scared about that also now how, what, what to do about clots i think if you encounter big clots intraoperatively or some of them if they were present pre uh, from pre operative period also how do you manage it so i think simplest is which most of our, my vr colleagues uh, are very well aware if you have you can just use this uh, uh, reflux action from your back flush and this is a very easy and faster way of get rid getting rid of blood just be careful don't direct your stream towards fovea and new vascular complexes di avoid directing it uh, to them otherwise i think it works very fast and you can get rid of blood uh, very easily now again i think unfortunately uh, this photographs have not come up this was again a very aggressive pdr patient and after completing all your dissection which you have seen in uh, all the videos in this instruction course when you get a finally you get a blood like this again uh, how to address it is one is now because you have done the dissections you know where your your nvcs are lying don't try to pull that clot over that areas and again your disc is the favorite site where you can again uh, pick up the clot and i'm sorry yeah and you can actually you you will see this you can actually release this clot from the uh, over the disc and that is the safest area because you know uh, uh, you have done dissections uh, chances of creating a break there is very less and get rid of that big clot and then rest of the liquid uh, liquefied blood you can clear with the reflux uh, action and in the end you will have a very small size of clot in and in multiple areas which will easily get absorbed uh, but sometimes you have a very thick uh, clot like disc we have uh, actually reported this also it can actually look like a nucleus uh, and none of your 25 gauge or even 23 gauge cutter is going to remove it easily so i think you can use a phaco fragmentoma also i think this is just to share this uh, idea which i think dr reddy uh, gave us maybe 6 7 years back we were struggling with a big clot uh, in uh, rp centers ot and then he reflectively said why not use a fragmentoma and then i think i think we have shown in that publication that it was hardly over in 30 40 seconds and uh, it was a huge uh, nucleus like clot so this is one small tip for uh, all the i'll just quickly share one last video and i am done again we encountered a massive clot uh, recently uh, you see this this was organized blood with uh, uh, detachment and massive uh, subretinal clot it was looking like a choroidal mass we got the histopathology also done but again the something which i wanted to share was because i wanted the tissue for sample i had to use a foreign body forceps by manually to take out this huge clot so and we actually treated it like a 
mass lesion unless uh, uh, until we got the histopathology report which has shown that it was just blood uh, from pdr so i think uh, with this i'll end my presentation and we can take questions thank you this one uh, point it's best to relieve the traction over that break and uh, drain as much as srf as possible so this allows the retina to settle down and the counter traction uh, is also uh, like available you and you can start peeling at other areas just to add to your points yeah great point i think uh, we have a, a keynote address also in this session uh, may i invite uh, professor dr nitin uh, for his keynote address and uh, Our apologies for I think uh, uh, for next session uh, chairperson and participants uh, and uh, Dr. Eddie, can you briefly introduce sir? Hobart Eye Surgeon Hobart Eye Surgeon from Hobart is a clinical professor, general ophthalmology, cataract, oculoplasty, and uh, he'll be talking about intraocular pressure raise following intravitreal injections. And I'm sorry, uh, but those videos were so, so they were really fascinating. And uh, I don't do that anymore. But I'd like to bring your attention to uh, the issue of intraocular pressure with repeated intravitreal injections. And just thinking of pressures running for 80, 90, 100 millimeters of mercury for some time, I was thinking, gosh, this can certainly cause problems with the uh, with the optic nerve. So intravitreal injections are now. Uh, 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 you know, it's part of life. It, they produce great results, uh, great outcomes. We use them for almost everything uh, that would respond to them. But do we really think of the short and long-term effects of intraocular injections? Uh, so this is really what I wanted to talk about. And most of us don't really check the intraocular pressure after injections. We are dealing with an older population, we're dealing with a vulnerable population, and especially a lot of people in this age group that we deal with uh, and with the morbidities we deal with have uh, glaucoma. So each time we carry out an intravitreal injection, the pressures can go up to you know, astronomical levels. Uh, this is what happens with an intravitreal, intravitreal injection of triamcinolone, which is really the volume of 0.1 mil. But uh, within 20, 30 minutes, everything comes down. Does it cause structural changes? The answer is yes. It changes the, uh, the Brooks membrane opening, not only at the first injection, but after first, second, and third injections, and the effects are even visible one year later. There's also a slight reduction in RNFL thickness. Why does this intraocular pressure rise occur? It occurs uh, simply while well, you inject volume but it could also be due to biochemical changes. It could be to the fact that we're using high molecular weight proteins, uh, structural changes. And in fact, uh, you know, when you use a syringe, it moves quite smoothly. And that's because it's got particles of silicon and lubricants inside. And uh, these also have at times caused clusters of elevation of intraocular pressure. Remember also that uh, when you inject, uh, you know, sometimes you see a reflux and you quickly try and stop that reflux with a cotton bud or something. Is that good? Is that bad? But we know that with reflux, the intraocular pressure after injection is lower than, than, than without reflux. But also one worries about, has a bit of the drug come out, you know, does this reduce or increase the risk of endophthalmitis? Uh, but certainly reflux is, uh, uh, you know, part of, part of the deal. Some examples of patients who've, uh, who, whom we've been monitoring for glaucoma, patients who had intravitreal injections, and here's an example of one. Uh, but we also have patients where the pressure doesn't rise. And after injection, there's a one-eyed patient whose pressure would, would be in the 20s, 30s, and then it go no to no PL. So we tried using an, uh, a Honan balloon, you're all familiar with, uh, but then found that just using a simple intraocular pressure lowering drop that we use for glaucoma given two hours before seems to work equally well. Sometimes you think maybe I'll inject just that little bit less and that, but that also does work. Uh, so 
and the effect of these glaucoma drops lasts even up to two hours after the injection. So it doesn't matter which drop you use, but it works. So it seems that uh, short-term pressure st spikes are not a big, big problem. And where you are worried, you can pre-treat with some glaucoma medication, and that will give you the desired uh, buffer. But patients who've got uh, glaucomatous optic atrophy already would be a problem, and they're the ones that you need to be careful about. So let's look at the long-term effects. All the pivotal studies did not uh, address this issue simply because many of them excluded people with high intraocular pressures. And if you look at it, you don't really get any answer uh, from these very controlled trials. The American Academy also tried to look at what happens with intraocular pressures in the long term, and they came up with uh, basically no definitive answer. And also there's a significant variability between studies because they use different criteria, different machines to check the intraocular pressure. So we really don't have much to go on, although some meta-analysis did try to address this, but you find that they did consider glaucoma as a risk factor and studied that for, uh, to see what happens. So we thought, well, let's look at our own patients. So we, we looked at patients over a 10-year, over a 11-year year period, uh, really the results of over 20,000 injections to see what really happens. So we're really looking at intraocular pressure elevation in this time, but then also looked at a couple of other questions that come up. So we had 1,086 uh, patients. Uh, um, some of them had glaucoma. Uh, really what we found was that our incidence for AMD pressure elevations were less than the diabetes angle. Uh, there was no difference in indication for treatment, uh, really, but uh, nor was there any difference in the drug injected. So even though some studies showed that ranibizumab had higher pressure elevation, we, uh, we didn't find that to be the case. The multivariate analysis also, the confidence intervals and the spread was such that it didn't come out with any, any answers. But uh, here's an example of a patient who had stable ocular hypertension. The glaucoma indices functional parameters did not change uh, with time. Another patient who had well-controlled glaucoma, and you can see that, you know, we monitor everything and then again there were no, there were no changes. But in a, in a third case where the uh, uh, as, as one-eyed patient who had a retinal vein occlusion, you can see that the visual acuity and macular thickness were, were pretty good, but uh, with time, the pressures didn't behave very well, and in these patients, you see that the, the glaucoma indices actually worsened, as you can see over here. So, so really what, what it comes down to is the fact that patients with elevated intraocular pressure or at high risk, one needs to be uh, careful with them. So where do we fit in the global uh, studies, that's where we are. We found a uh, sustained elevation of intraocular pressure, which really is pressures above 22, more than six millimeters of mercury at baseline on three occasions, or an absolute pressure of more than 26 millimeters of mercury. We found that our, uh, you know, our cohort, it was uh, as shown here. We looked at the other parameters uh, and found that uh, the, the average number of days from injection is more than a year that it takes for the pressure to start climbing up and misbehaving. Uh, diabetic patients are at particular risk, uh, especially those with uh, higher levels of HbA1c. Uh, and this is not our study, but uh, you know, just to answer questions, does repeated injection or a repeated injection cause changes in the outflow facility? The answer is yes. Uh, especially in patients who are receiving frequent uh, injections. As you can see here, the, uh, uh, the, the outflow facility actually decreases the higher the pressure is with repeated intravitreal injections. Of course, nothing happens without uh, genes and genetics, but we are able to predict in some groups where they are at risk of uh, visual field loss. There were complexes where uh, of... Uh, of sustained intraocular pressure increase based on the presence of silicon and impurities, but uh, once the drugs have been filtered and the silicon removed from syringes, these uh, have not recurred. When ILEA came out, the, uh, there was this whole thing of uh, you know, pressure rising, and that was because we are used to giving a heart.
hard push at the end and I suppose that if you prime it properly and inject it gently, they, this problem won't be there. So in summary, uh, I think we found that 117 of our patients developed a sustained elevation of intraocular pressure. The uh, elevation of intraocular pressure was not related to the type of anti-VEGF treatment. Uh, it was associated pre with pre-existing disease and lens status, so glaucoma, ocular hypertension, and fakia. Uh, glaucoma, it was 3.5-fold uh, increased risk of elevated intraocular pressure, and pseudofakia, in a sense, reduces the risk. So the, ta it's, it's, the take-home message is really that intravitreal injections, repeated intravitreal injections can cause problems uh, in selected cases with, uh, with IOP changes. Intravitreal injections do cause structural changes in the eye, and I think we really need to uh, monitor susceptible uh, patients uh, more closely when we are going on this journey of repeated intravitreal injections, but I suppose the challenge is, uh, is identifying these patients. So I just leave you with that because I know, uh, you know, you raise the pressures, they raise the pressures, but you do it not so often, but with intravitreal injections, it's a long journey. So thank you. Uh, I think uh, topic and uh, I think uh, quite enlightening and uh, I, there we have been quite a few reports on this uh, like all of us we are colleagues uh, uh, across India also following this that uh, we are little more sensitive now towards IOP in our anti uh, patients also anyway we were doing it very uh, uh, we are observing it very closely for DEXA implant patients but anti are also you know are not that benign uh, from glaucoma perspective i think very useful insight uh, but uh, i think do you think uh, you will still worry injecting in a glaucoma patient after this much of information and new insights uh, well you want to make sure they maintain their vision because of the macular problem but don't go blind from glaucoma and I, and, and all vitreoretinal surgeons have seen that good result pale disc uh, and, and I think that that is something that we need to we need to worry about. So in selected uh, people, we tend to check the intraocular pressure before they leave the injection area. Uh, you know, especially ones whose uh, glaucoma indices are going downwards. Uh, but most most people, and and another uh, group is where uh, you know where you're doing bilateral injections. You need to be very careful there because they may not report. Uh, report anything because the other eye. So. Absolutely. And we all realize this that uh, functional and I think we have a glaucoma specialist here. So that structural and functional test will fail us when once you have a macular pathology and all our yes. cases. So then IOP is the only thing which we can monitor. And so I think when your structural and functional tests are not performing well, how do you adjust the target IOP? Like if you bring it lower down like should be what yeah. should we do sir if the if the, the disc is too much damaged then we err on the side of uh, little lower iops and uh, we still can follow up on the imaging and visual fields if they are changing parameters changing uh, lo we'll increasing to, losses i'm sorry Dr. i'm going to cut you down and uh, I, I, I think the next uh, sessions uh, speakers yeah. are there yes yes so thank you everyone and uh, uh, apologies for overshooting